Right, so today I'm going to talk unashamedly uh, in a non-academic way. So I was sitting in the last panel thinking, my God, this room is full of people who have enormous academic skills that are way above uh, my level. Um, when I did my Masters at Oxford, um, I was allowed to enter the group that uh, contained people who would become special advisors to Boutras, Boutras, Gavi, and there would be enormous academic discussions regarding well, how the UN should respond to this, that and the other. There were three of us. Um, that had lived for uh, various periods of time with refugees in the mud and periodically the professor would turn to us and go okay so now let's ask the people who uh, really have some knowledge on this question to um, you know, give an opinion on it. So I hope the audience will respond to me in the same way regarding uh, this particular issue. So let me just open up the presentation. Did you say it's on the... So I've been asked to speak um, for about 15 minutes on financing. Um, I was going to specifically look at issues regarding how you try to attract the private sector into um, areas of extreme poverty that presently lack renewable energy services. So these are areas where the market is failing, um, so private sector providers cannot provide an energy service because the consumers um, cannot pay a price point that is suitable uh, for a return for those investors. Um, Renewable World, as an organisation, as, as was mentioned earlier, is, uh, grew out of the renewable energy industry, was supported by around 50 to 60 companies across the industry, specifically with a mandate to try and mobilise and promote affordable renewable energy services uh, to some of the poorest consumers in the world, um, in places where the market is not functioning. So this is uh, basically our bread and butter in terms of uh, how we try to operate. Um, just. Uh, very quickly, we are essentially trying to promote affordable, reliable energy services for communities um, and work across a series of technologies, so hydro, biogas, uh, solar and wind. So, specifically discussing um, the issue of financing. Um, we work in three areas, not sure if you can see this, but economic initiation, economic enhancement and transition into a functioning market. And I'm going to talk about one example of economic initiation. So this is uh, a community which is in Mozambique, um, an area where the market is not functioning, so where commercial responses are not able to provide energy services for the poorest. And the barriers are so acute um, that successful economic activity may be virtually impossible. In this context, multiple factors are needed to alleviate the situation of acute poverty, but clearly energy and energy access is absolutely critical um, to that situation. So this particular village that I'm focusing on has a population of around 1,000. It's an exceptionally isolated location. It's about six hours drive from the main urban centre, and you could speak to one of the um, people that I took from a major energy company regarding his experience of getting there and getting back. Uh, in terms of how remote it was. Um, it is a coastal community which traditionally relied upon fishing, but the, the fishing stocks um, have been depleting over years, over a number of years, and as a result there is a need to understand how, uh, how alternative incomes um, could be uh, in, could be utilised in these particular areas um, as alternative ways of income. Um, attempts to grow crops to date have la largely failed because of a lack of water particularly in the dry season. So there is a need um, to pump water um, to provide appropriate crops uh, all, all, all year round, which would enable uh, significantly enhanced market prices um, to be um, utilised for those crops, and this would mean that incomes would be raised. So we've worked with uh, a local provider, a local energy company there, to provide a wind hybrid solar system. Um, and um, worked closely with the local farmers' business association to establish that system and run it. And the farmers' association is formalised specifically um, to build the institutional structure and the organisational processes to make this system a reality. And I'll go on to discuss that as one of the key barriers for the effective functioning of services uh, in these kind of locations. Um, just to say that the farmers' association now is able to produce 
uh, crops for profit and have increased their the sales quite significantly and are utilizing that um, additional income for a whole series of other activities. Um, what's fascinating about this example is that the entrepreneurial skills which you see um, from this particular group of people have meant that they now just have decided to use the energy uh, for charging mobile phones, for setting up other services like barber shops, um, and uh, for lighting of a local shop. And that um, entrepreneurial activity is part of the process for pushing forward the financial sustainability of the system. Um, one of the most important barriers uh, that exist in terms of providing services in these kind of areas is how, as Jim pointed out, is how you persuade um, private sector providers to come in um, and then uh, you, um, provide their services at a price point that is appropriate. I, was, I had a long conversation with a bank uh, about two weeks ago regarding how we were trying to encourage them to provide financing for uh, these kind of communities. And uh, their comments was that it was much easier to work in areas that were uh, either the, the um, richest people of the poor or else the poorest of, of the middle. And when we got to the conversation where we were discussing how do you respond to the poorest of the poor, then their response was, well, actually, that's incredibly difficult. So this is the conundrum in terms of how you try to respond to um, those, those particular communities. And the question that the bank was, uh, was focusing down on was, how do you get appropriate ownership, management, and governance structures in place to encourage um, private sector providers to come in? So I wanted to draw on some of the lessons from this particular uh, area um, to discuss uh, how you could try and reduce the barriers and improve the possibility um, that private sector providers would be interested in these particular areas. This um, is one of the uh, capacity building um, inputs that we provide to our partners um, and we have an enabling um, environment model here that discusses various of these including technical inputs, um, strengthening of governance, um, and business modelling and so on. But the one I'm going to focus on today is ownership, management um, and governance. So from the research that we've done in this particular area um, and from um, other uh, communities that we have worked in, um, the issues that we have identified as being critical in terms of these uh, issues are with respect to ownership. Legal ownership does not necessarily need to coincide with perceived ownership. Uh, one can be present without the other. Perceived ownership can be more important sometimes than legal ownership, particularly given um, the particular context in which normative structures or educational structures uh, are not well developed. Um, and the perceived ownership can have greater impact on the manager's and the user's sense of responsibility regarding how, to, how they should run this kind of business. The perceived ownership can be enhanced if the end unit users participate in the management governance um, structures as well as the planning and the decision making processes. It is uh, positive to try to mainstream the clear relationship between the perceived ownership of the system and the recognition of the benefits of that system. So an explicit description of the shared value between all of the stakeholders who benefit from it. So those people who might sell inputs into the energy system, those people that might buy outputs and then utilize them for other productive uses. Um, it can be uh, advisable to spread ownership across a, across a wide set of stakeholders to improve the accountability of the management board and reduce the propensity for mismanagement. And um, this, of course, is a, an issue that you would see in the largest of companies. I'm sure if Barclays were in the room, they could talk to you about those particular issues. Um, but uh, it, it works on a small scale um, as well. And ownership models um, can alter from time to time, which is one of the issues that uh, we heard from Alison uh, in the previous session that uh, one size fits all should, um, should not be regarded as the only way. Um, and the um, ownership can be transferred from one set of stakeholders to another as the complexity of the system and the ability of those stakeholders to understand more complex management systems um, is enhanced. With respect to management, there is a need to pay for enterprising and rigorous management. Um, often this is not conceptualised in these kind of systems but it is critically important in terms of uh, ensuring that systems are run well and that there is a specific uh, function that uh, allows um, systems to be uh, carried forward. Um, projects whose management and governance structures follow a market-based business approach tend to be more replicable and more scalable, uh, improving the likelihood of overall success. 
Market-based approaches uh, may require some support um, to be immediately feasible, and I'm sure you can imagine in this, these particular circumstances that is absolutely the case, um, because of course, uh, with the significant number of barriers that exist to market development, there is a need to stimulate that, both through, through capacity building, but also through um, upfront capital investment in terms of cash that would, would be provided. More profitable margins uh, are used the profitable margins from these kind of systems are usually, however, fairly slim, and it may be difficult to motivate talented entrepreneurs um, to invest into these particular kind of rural uh, electrification systems. So there needs to be a response in terms of how you try to motivate people to engage with them. Um, and businesses and products should not be afraid, afraid to adapt an evolutionary approach to, to the management structure. A renewable energy system could begin its life being managed by an informal committee and that, can, that could progress onto a cooperative um, and a more formal structure over time. The last issue to look at is governance. Uh, with respect to governance, end user engagement is essential for instilling a sense of responsibility in the system um, and it can also stimulate other benefits uh, such as uh, gender empowerment or um, involvement of different uh, types of um, uh, sections of the community. Um, whichever ownership management model is chosen, the organisational infrastructure should be as transparent and accountable as possible, and time needs to be given to understanding how to promote um, that particular, that kind of accountability. Um, just to, to finish off this section, um, it's clearly critical uh, that um, if you're going to um, try to persuade a private sector provider to come in, that you're able to present to them a positive net present value in terms of the analysis of the business um, going forward. So cash flow for 10 to 15 year projections are absolutely critical and as a result productive uses are fundamental in terms of understanding the, the setup um, of the energy business. Um, as I mentioned, um, some, some people in the community may sell inputs into the energy system, so if you think about biogas, some people may be selling dung into it, but then others may be buying outputs from that system, so they might be buying uh, biogas from it to, um, to then utilise in their own particular models. And the interaction between those particular uh, small businesses is absolutely critical in terms of understanding the financial sustainability um, of the, uh, entire, um, the entire business proposal going forward. And so we work very closely with partners to try and build their capacity on cash flow analysis. It's one of the elements that we utilise in our sustainability model. Um, this was developed with us uh, by a um, professor from Cambridge University and um, financial sustainability is clearly critical there but we also look at technical, environmental, organisational and social cultural. But I can't emphasise enough that um, if in the longer term businesses are going to be interested uh, in this, then they need to have a clear understanding of the appropriate cash flows going in and out of, of the systems. So productive uses are recognised as being positive for all sorts of reasons for increasing income and also providing other types of uh, societal benefits, um, increasing productivity. But I think fundamentally they are useful because they will ultimately help to attract uh, private sector providers uh, and investors to, uh, to come into these and support these kind of systems. Thank you very much, Neil.